In the name of God, amen. Please be seated. The obvious starting point for a gathering with the expressed view of renewing a vow is to call to mind the time we made the vow for the first time. So I invite you back to the time when, without a doubt, you knew. You knew that I had decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. So we're going to pick up the pace a little. Now, for some of us, that moment, that decision is decisive and clear. And for others, the the decision kind of snuck up on us. And the memory is more like a recognition or an acknowledgement of something that had been true about us for some time. And then came all those other decisions that followed from the first one, the other vows. For some of us on the path of ordination in the church and for most other Christians, a different path of discipleship in witness and witness in other vocational realms. Whatever the path, whatever the vow, here we are now. And we are asked if we want to re-up make new the vows we once made. And we'd be made of stone, actually, and maybe not completely honest with ourselves if we didn't acknowledge that for some, from time to time we question, because we must question and test past decisions. It's both human and it's necessary because so much changes. So we come to a day like today and ask, given who we are now and what we know now and what's happening in us, to us, and in the world around us now, do we choose again? Do we decide again? First, follow Jesus, second, to renew any vows that followed the first, and if so, how do we choose, which is to say, what does it look like now? There's that poignant moment in the Gospel of John. It's after Jesus has gone on for a very long and confusing chapter about being the bread of life. Every preacher's dread when it comes up in the Sunday lectionary for an entire month. And understandably, after that discourse, many people who had once decided to follow Jesus began having second thoughts. This saying is too hard for us, they said. And one by one, they turned back until Jesus was alone with the twelve. And he looks at them. Just picture that. He looks at them and he asks, do you also wish to go away? I wonder what a 21st century version of that question would be. What about you, my 21st century disciples of the Episcopal Church, given all that you know now, everything and everyone who has hurt you, disappointed you, frustrated, offended, outraged, and exhausted you. What about you? Do you also wish to go away? When he first asked that question, Simon Peter, characteristically, spoke up for the Twelve 
in the way that breaks my heart every time I read it, you remember what he said, Lord, to whom would we go? Where would we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. They had gone too far to turn back now. So I've been thinking about my answer, and it's something like, Jesus, given all that you know about me, if you'll still have me, man, (laughs) I'm with you. So what about you? Now, I'm assuming you've answered that question already. Um, So now let's get to the all-important distinction between our vows and our jobs, or whatever particular way we live out our vows at any given time. Because that changes too, of course. I mean, that does change how we live our vows, and it can change a lot. Sometimes because of choices we make, often because of choices that other people make, and equally as often because of forces beyond their, our control. I mean, just think of our brothers and sisters in Ukraine, right? How much has changed for them? And that can happen to any of us. So here's the second question. What can you and I say about our vocation in this world that we know is true and would be true for us even if all the external expressions that now define that vow were taken. There was a community organizing song, union union organizing song from the 70s that went something like, your life is more than your work, and your work is more than your job. Our life in Christ is more than our vocation. And our vocation is way bigger than any job in the church, right? So what, what do you know about your vow, your vocation that's bigger, that can't be taken from you, even if everything else is taken from you? And that's a tough question, but ultimately it's so freeing. Because once we even have a glimmer of an answer, we are... S- We are less dependent on people and external circumstances to live a meaningful and faithful life. I mean, granted, there are optimal places from which to fulfill our vocations, and and we are blessed when we are given them, but there are no shortage of less than optimal places. And I'm not saying this to justify unjust or oppressive systems but rather to celebrate the genius of human creativity and resilience and how the Holy Spirit is so perfectly free to move in this world as it is. And for followers of Jesus, this openness, this clarity, it puts us in a mindset of service, of service and faithfulness rather than privilege and entitlement and perpetual disappointment and well-honed outrage, right? Places us in a posture of service to this world because it helps us somberly recognize what can, in fact, be taken from us, and it gives us a rock-solid confidence in what cannot, because what the world didn't give, the world can't take away. If you're of a certain age, you remember when Like me, Amy Grant was this Christian rock musician, right? Soaring on the charts, the Christian rock charts, didn't even know they existed until I heard of her. 
And then she crossed over into pop music, and she was this phenomenon for the 90s and the aughts. Um, she's not so hot anymore, but she's, she plays still. You know, she plays in venues around the country, small stages, uh, county fairs, country and rock shows, right? And I heard in a career, an interview she said once, I've never forgotten it, she says, you know, she had this meteoric career, and she said, all along, I wanted to be faithful on the way up, and I want to be equally faithful on the way down. And one of the most moving eulogies I've ever heard was one a good friend of mine gave her, his mom, who by virtue of severe physical illness and then later dementia, lost everything that defined her as a person, everything externally that defined her as a human being. And he said, all that was left was the love. Embedded in the Gospel of John passage we've just heard and that you have printed is another line of Jesus that stops me cold every time I hear or read it. It's when he says, Lord, now my soul is troubled. And what should I say? Father, save me from this hour? No. It is for this reason that I have come to this hour. Father, Glorify your name. This is John's version of what we hear in the Synoptic Gospels from the Garden of Gethsemane. Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass, but not my will, yours be done. In neither version is Jesus a victim, although it's clear he would have preferred things to turn out different, have turned out differently. John's version, written a full generation later, not only with the benefit of hindsight, but equally important, more important, the lived experience of knowing the risen Christ, sees in that moment when Jesus' soul was troubled and he accepted what he did not want but freely chose anyway for love's sake. If losing everything was what love required, then that is what he would do because that is why he came. Now, if you're wondering if your bishop has forgotten everything she's talked about in the past year about the need for rest and self-care and healthy boundaries and Sabbath, rest assured, I have not. But here's the thing. The cross of Jesus doesn't have much to say to us about those good and necessary things, except perhaps to be mindful of the false crosses or the ones that don't belong to us, which is a sermon for another day. Nor does it convey the full power, the cross does not convey its full power to us when, as a serenity prayer, we are called to change the things that we do have, in fact, the power to change. The cross isn't for that. As much as the cross of Jesus and Jesus on the cross is there for us in those times when we must face, as he did, the things we cannot change. And we need a power and a grace and a spiritual strength that is not our own from which to live and to die and to rise again. This past year, I, I had two extraordinary experiences of reconciling with people that I had deeply wounded in my younger years. First was my half-brother, Jim, who hadn't spoken to me or any member of our family for over 20 years, and he did this amazingly brave thing and showed up at his mother's, my stepmother's funeral back in October. Hadn't spoken to her either. And he allowed me and my sister back into his life and that of his family. Now, he's since shut that door again for reasons I don't fully understand, but for a brief moment I had a glimpse of what might be possible someday, a reconciled family. Second 
experience has flowered into a new relationship with our godson, Eliel, who was a boy. Paul and I met when we lived in Honduras over 30 years ago, who I failed twice. And I'll tell you those stories someday if you like. But fast forward to last summer, and we track him down through social media. And then we start communicating, first by text, then by telephone, and then finally Paul and I took a train up to Queens, and we met him. And he's lived in New York for the past 16 years, undocumented. His life is hard in all the ways you would imagine for a single, undocumented man living in New York. But he is rock solid about what his life purpose is now. You see, he has two young nephews in Honduras that he's never met and perhaps never will. But he is nonetheless their financial support. They depend on him and have, ever since their mother, his half-sister, committed suicide. So Eliel works nights in a restaurant to which he commutes over an hour and a half each way by subway. He lives in a small room that he rents from a Mexican family, and we talk now or text almost every morning as Eliel is returning from work and I'm beginning my day. Buenos dias, madrina. I get these little vocal messages every morning. ¿Cómo estás? Espero que esté bien. ¿Estás tomando tu cafecito? We just, and we just talk. And the reason I'm telling you about Eliel, and I am going to sit down soon, I promise, but the reason I'm telling you about him is that he said to me, he has said to me twice now, that if given the opportunity, he would live his life over again as it was with gratitude. He's a man of grace and courage, generosity of spirit, his faith is strong. He knows why he's here. He lives for love. Don't you want to live like that? Don't you want to die with my friend's mother's grace? Don't you want to be faithful on the way up and on the way down? I do. So that's why I've decided I'm still in with Jesus because I can't do this on my own. And so I will serve him in whatever vocation I'm given, and if it's all taken from me, I'll, f I'll find another way. And I pray for the grace to trust him enough to know that no matter what happens in this world, by his grace, we can get up every morning and still manage to love somebody and be grateful for this life lived under the power of his cross. I'm really grateful to walk the path with you. Amen.